I predict, uh, history will tell, in the next 10, 20 years, multidisciplinary degree programs are going to be the norm, as well as upskilling and reskilling to meet the workforce demand that don't require a college degree is going to be what higher education institutions are going to be known for. Welcome to the UIUC talk show. Our goal of the show is to introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas. Today, we're having a conversation with Chancellor Robert J. Jones. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a deep honor and pleasure to be here. The honor is ours. So I want to start with an interesting question here. Yeah. Is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're probably one of the best chancellors in the country, one of the most successful and, but you know that regardless that you're here or not, uh, the university will keep going beyond your age, beyond I mean, many chancellors. So what's the meaning behind all of this? Like what keeps you going day to day? Well, what keeps me going is the opportunity, number one, to lead one of the best higher education institutions, best research universities. I think not only in the country, but in the world and to see the impact that this university has on the lives of students that come through here, faculty that we hire, graduates that come through this place, both at the undergraduate, graduate, and professional level, really gives me a great sense of satisfaction of making a difference through education, which has kind of been the hallmark for my own journey that led me to pursue higher education and to have this awesome opportunity to be in a leadership role that does that at scale and does that on a regular basis of educating so many people that go on to do wonderful things in the world and in many cases redefine the word impossible as we say constantly. So that's what drives me. That's what gives me the great sense of satisfaction. You mentioned um, that your own history is what is one of the main sources of motivation that keeps you going, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some ideals that you still carry forward with you regardless of wherever you go and something that helps you run an institution like this? Well, I, I think it, it grows out of a, a strong sense of excellence, mm -hmm. you know, to whatever you do, be the best at it that you can. Right. And uh, we are all placed on this planet, I think, for a purpose. And, and hopefully that purpose is to do uh, a greater good. Right. And uh, so that's how I looked at my own journey to education. I pursued an education uh, because to me it was a, a means to an end to have a life that was much better than what my parents experienced. My parents couldn't afford to send me to college. Mm -hmm. So I worked a full-time job my junior and senior year in high school just to save enough money to that if I was fortunate enough to get into a college, at right. least could pay for the first year of tuition. And um, then along the way, I've had, had mentors. I've had people that have uh, mentored me along the way. In high school, I had a vocational ag teacher who started to call me professor in the ninth grade. And then when I got to college, I had a professor who took me under his wing and made sure that I got the best internships and the best work-study opportunities possible. And told me that I was going to graduate school and uh, told me I was going to University of Georgia, and I did that. And at Georgia, I came out of the tutelage of two of the best scientists in the world that helped launch my research career right. as a plant physiologist and ultimately led me to the University of Missouri, where I came out of the tutelage of one of the best plant physiologists in the world. And that launched me and set me up for my tenure track position at the University of Minnesota when I was 26 years old. So I had help and mentors and support along the way that has allowed me to pursue my educational support. And that's what we try to do along the way for both uh, students in pre-K through 12. That's why we have a focus now on pre-K through 12 education. That's how we have a very strong focus on providing amazing opportunities at the undergraduate level. We're very proud of the Illinois commitment because that's a way to send a very strong message about don't worry about what it costs to enroll in the University of Illinois at Banner champaign 
Right. Just prepare yourself and you too can get a whole nother education. Mm. And one of the like big parts of the story <clears throat> is that the mentors that you found along the way, because those are, if it matters a lot who teaches you and under whom you learn, because if you're not, like a subject can be interesting, but if it's not taught in the right way, you might not fully realize it's like beauty, right? So is there is there a mentor or some like figure who you still remember to this day who you're thankful for or who would say led you to where you are today? I'm sure there are multiple people. But. Well, it's the four people that I mentioned uh, that taught me along the way in my pursuit of education. But all along the way, I've had mentors. You know, mm. first of all, my parents right. were tremendous mentors, and notwithstanding the fact they only had a fifth, uh, about a seventh and eighth grade education between them, they knew the value of an education and insisted that we pursue education. Mm -hmm. And then the other four examples that I gave you all along my quest from undergraduate school, from high school to undergraduate to graduate. But um, even professionally, you don't stop being mentored after you get a college degree or even after you get a PhD. Because one of my most profound mentors was someone who became the provost. He was the former dean of the College of Education at University of Minnesota. He became the provost. I was the first person he hired in his new responsibilities as a chief academic officer at that university. I didn't necessarily have the lineage, mm -hmm. if you will, or hadn't had the typical set of experiences to become the first executive vice provost at the University of Minnesota under his leadership, right. where he took a chance on me, gave me great responsibility for restructuring. The most critical process within a university is his promotion and tenure process. He gave me the responsibility for driving that and to restructuring it in a way that still exists today. It's the first time I was the first executive vice provost to be hired in the history of the university. And under his tutelage, he, along the way over the course of the next 10, 15 years, uh, whenever he had a big idea about a new leadership position, he would come to me and say, I've been thinking about doing this. I want you to do it. Mm. And so I guess the moral of that story is mentors continue throughout your life, if you're lucky, even after you finish your, your formal educational pursuits. And Bob Brunix did that for me. He took a chance on me. And every job that he gave me, I tried to do it to the best of my ability. And apparently I did well enough that he would add additional responsibilities. So the course of probably about 15 years working for him, he really became the benchmark to me that has helped shape my style and my focus on leading universities. This is the second university that I have led in the last decade. Right. I spent uh, four years as president of SUNY Albany. Mm -hmm. And I'm in my seventh year here now as the chancellor of University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And so professionally, Bob Brunix, former president of the University of Minnesota, was that mentor to me that taught me how mm. to be a very, very thoughtful, strategic thinking, and hopefully successful university leader. And you mentioned that you had a lot of hardships along the way too, like just growing up and it was like reaching this stage wasn't an easy path, right? And that that is something that is still true for many students today. Like that's hardships, like regardless of where you were born in like a century ago or like today, you're still gonna be facing a different, maybe a different kind of hardship, but still hardships to reach to the level where you want to be, right? Yeah. Um, so, Knowing, that, like being a chancellor, you, I'm sure you're familiar with all the hardships that today's generation and the students today face. Um, if you had a chance to meet one of the students today who's, who's just going through a tough time or has a lot of hardships going on in their life, regardless of what they could be, what would you tell them to, to let them see the light of the end of the tunnel? Well, we don't. We try to approach this not just on that random student who might approach me about the hardship they're having. We look at this as a cohort across the whole university. Right. That is why we started things like the Illinois Commitment, because we knew for far too many students, they wouldn't even bother to apply to this university because the optic was it cost too much. Mm -hmm. All they saw was the sticker price for tuition. Tuition, they actually didn't understand what it actually cost. Mm. And so we decided to create a strategy that for about 30% of our first year class each year is a recipient of 
free tuition and fees to attend this university. If they come from a family of $67,100 or less, they get free tuition and fees. So that takes part of the worry, mm -hmm. take part of the obstacle that many students uh, have had to face in terms of the issue of affordability. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. I think you may be aware we're partnering with a nonprofit called Hope Chicago. Mm -hmm. I sit on their board of directors. We were one of the first anchor institutions they asked us about joining. And that involves five public schools in Chicago public school system where over the course of the next decade, the goal is to educate 25 to 30,000 students debt free. And so that is the major obstacle to pursuing an education. And this, this uh, hypothetical student that I would meet mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't had the benefit of having a tuition-free education, that changes a lot of things for a lot of students because access and affordability is the biggest issues that all of our students face. And we're very, very proud of the fact that we haven't just sat on the sideline for this issue. We created the Illinois Commitment. We created the Illinois Promise. This is a full ride scholarship. And now we're partnering with Chicago Public Schools and a guy named Peter uh, Cadence, who's the impetus for the, the philanthropist who started this whole thing to really create a debt-free education for, for thousands of students. And so that uh, we're doing our part to keep education accessible and affordable. And I can tell you some of the most gratifying work that um, I've been involved in, because at the end of the day, that is the major barrier is affordability mm. and access to an amazing education at an at affordable price is something we care greatly about. And it's one of the reasons we are spending about $50 million more now than we were spending six years ago when I came here to provide greater financial aid to a broader array of students. So. That's what gets us excited, and that is one of the reasons that at this juncture, we're not where we need to be, but one of the little known facts is the fact that about 54% of our students today graduate with zero debt. Mm. A lot of people don't understand that, 54%. And the ones that do graduate with debt is a fraction of what the national average is. Our students graduate with just slightly between twenty-three dollars to $24,000 in debt. And I don't call that debt, I call that an investment and a life-changing experience that's gonna pay dividends for decades to come. And, um, and so that's what we're doing in order to try to keep education accessible and affordable. That's a big part of what we've invested our time and our energy into doing that at the same time uh, maintaining the optics that this is a world-class university. You get a world-class education here, and you can go out and change the world. Another topic I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, <clears throat> it's uh, fundraising. So you guys successfully fundraise more than $2 billion. $2.7 billion. There you go, almost $3 billion. <laughs> So I'm curious, so could you walk me through, so if you were to teach me about fundraising, what would you tell me? like all about these specifics and, and, and everything else that surrounds that question. Because, you know, fundraising is such an important thing yeah. and doing it well is something that you guys did. Well, let me, let me share with you a philosophy that I adopted from uh, someone that I met when they were the dean of the School of Business at the University of Michigan. And it was when I was the coordinator of something that we do in the Big Ten called, it was called the, uh, it's called the Big Ten Academic Alliance now. It was called something else back in the day when I was, uh, responsible for overseeing it at Minnesota. And this particular person actually did go on to become uh, president of the system at one point. But his fundamental issue about fundraising is pretty basic. Mm -hmm. First of all, you got to ask. If you don't ask, <laughs> you don't get. I mean, that's pretty basic. But what he was saying in that simple message is you have to, first of all, have a, have a compelling argument and a compelling value proposition of why someone would want to give X number of dollars to X cause. And so you have to develop a very compelling message and compelling strategy, and I think we were able to do that. Uh, when I came here, we were just starting what we call the quiet phase of our uh, With Illinois fundraising goal. 
And then probably about two years or so into that process, we decided to launch in a very public way our desire to raise, at the time, $2.25 billion. And there were those that said there was no way that uh, people would give that kind of money to this public university. And I'm very proud of the fact, not, and they said you definitely couldn't do that in five years. Well, we did it in four. And in fact, by the end of the fifth year, we not only uh, we went way beyond 2.25 to raise nearly $2.7 billion. And the reason for that is, uh, and we did this during the midst of one of the most global, uh, tragic global pandemics and health crises in our living history. And we did it because primarily people, I think we told a very compelling story of why the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign should be thought about in the context of being worthy of receiving a, their, a gift of their time and their talent. And we structured the campaign differently than we've ever had in the history of the University of Illinois as a system of three universities. Uh, and this time around, we made the decision each campus would put forth their own campaign goals and focus it on their own alums rather than some broad system-wide initiative where you're asking people across all three campuses to give to one goal. And I think that was, first of all, the best and most fundamental decision that allowed not only Urbana-Champaign to be successful but in reaching our fundraising goals, University of Illinois Chicago uh, reached his $800 million um, uh, goal and uh, Springfield reached there, I think it was 400, I don't remember the exact, 40 million, I don't remember the exact numbers for those other places, but each of the three campuses exceeded their goals because each of the campuses were able to structure the strategy that focused on the things that their alums were more passionate about. And for us, it was a very clear goal of focusing more money on the thing we've been talking about, keeping education, education accessible and affordable. We focus on more money for scholarships and fellowship for our students. And then the second part of the request is more money to hire the best and the brightest faculty hmm. and to support them in their research and scholarship and, and, and uh, the work that they do to advance their reputation. And, uh, and I think we decided to take a different approach. We took this we had a big launch that was more like a big Las Vegas production than we've ever done before. And then we took a miniature version of that on the road to every major city where there's a large population of alums. We even took it to Shanghai. We took it to Korea. We took it uh, all across this the world and places where we have deep connection. And people really appreciate it, hearing about the university and the university telling its story in a much more compelling way than we ever had before, using digital technology, not just an opportunity for uh, uh, donors and alums to hear from me, but to hear from uh, our current students, our current undergraduate students, to hear from our researchers that are doing amazing research and cancer, brain cancer, using dogs as a model system. And so we brought all of that together in one of the most compelling, uh, high quality production, compelling production that only lasted on the road, it probably never lasted more than 25, 30 minutes. But it was 25, 30 minutes where we had that unbited attention. And each one was slightly different. Each one told a different narrative about the value proposition that this university brings to the table and help develop a very strong sense and remind our alums of the type of place that they graduated from and how this place has really distinguished itself among other universities. And that's something that we're both quite grateful to be part of the, the, the this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so a question that it's also, that's been happening is the, the question of, so, Colleges as a whole, they, you know, across the board, the, I mean, this college is an exemption because you guys haven't had tuition in the, in the last seven years, but colleges across the board, they've, they've had tuition. Uh, like the prices have re, uh, 
increase more than even medical inflation, and, and yeah. let alone inflation itself. Right. Uh, debt, obviously, it's, it's a big issue. You know, it's there's not a debt that you can't you know declare bankruptcy on. So it's just all there forever. And the question of going to university itself, it, it's uh, it's become more of a you know, is it actually worth it? So, and a lot of people started started to see in college as a not necessarily investment, but as an insurance. To the point where if you don't go to college, you know, you're gonna end up in you know, a homeless somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, what do you make of <clears throat> of that distinction of you know seeing college? You know, like you, you can see like if people say oh it's an investment and so on, but in reality, people might might actually see it as a, as an insurance. So, what does that say about our society? And and what do you make of that such well, framing? It's an investment. It's an insurance. And I've always said it's not necessarily for everyone. So I want to be clear about that. But I think for the majority of young people that are thinking about their future, college is the best way to assure a quality of life and a lifestyle that's perhaps better than what your parents have experienced. And I know you hear a lot of brouhaha about that now, but that still remains a very dominant and accurate narrative. It's about how do you, is it, college is not just an individual benefit and that's part of the problem now is perceived to be not just it back in the day when I was going through college getting a college was part of a, a public good that you got an education to improve not only yourself but to improve your community and to improve the livelihood of your family over time it's been perceived to be more of a, a, a private a public a private benefit and not necessarily uh, a public good and I just think uh, Part of the problem here is that we failed to tell the story about the importance of a college education in ways that are most compelling, given these contemporary times in which we live. So I still do believe that for the majority of us, uh, college education still remains the best investment that one can make in themselves and in the broader society. But there's always a but in these things. There's nothing that's 100%, particularly in these times in which we live. We also have come to know, because of technology, part of the technology that we've created at this university and many universities that are like us have created technologies that are really shaping a different kind of workforce, a type of workforce where a traditional college degree is not necessarily needed to meet the workforce demands. And so what I think colleges and universities have to do are two things. They have to continue to provide the most amazing, compelling argument about the importance of a college degree to tell that story much more effectively than what we have in the past because now another narrative, a college degree is not worth it. And part of it has to do with the folks that are graduating with an enormous amount of debt. They don't get the jobs that's, uh, that are necessary for them to cover that debt in a reasonable um, time period over their lifespan, and that feeds that narrative that, is it worth it? But I can tell you that it is worth it, but at the same time, uh, universities have to think about, given the changes in the workforce, given the changes that their jobs that are being created now that didn't exist two years ago, and some of these jobs don't require a college degree, but they require a specific set of skills and talents that you can't just acquire by finishing high school. You've got to have some training beyond high school in order to get those skills. And so one of the things we are strategically thinking about at this university, what is the role we play as a land-grant university? We have an obligation to educate the masses of people across the state of Illinois. And that was the original land-grant mission, and now it's across the nation and across the world. That's part of our our land grant mission. But in the context of that land grant mission, we're at a juncture now where undergraduate degrees, master's degrees, PhD degrees are still at the core of what we do and will always be at the core of what we do. But as a land grant university with the commitment to do the public good, we have to think strategically about how do we do the upskilling and the reskilling of a workforce that's changing so rapidly. And I hear from CEOs of companies that are telling me that they're going to need in the next two or three years 
to upscale or rescale 50% of that workforce. And then five years from now, they're gonna end up having to do the whole thing all over again. Just because the nature of work and how technology, how data sciences, uh, AI, imaging, all the stuff that is transforming society has created this whole new category of work and created a new workforce that may not need a college degree, but they're going to need to be constantly skilled and reskilled and upskilled. And so as a land grant university, we're uh, thinking about what is the appropriate role for us to play in this regard. So we'll continue to be best in class for undergraduate students from around the nation and around the world, but also masters and PhD and professional students. You know, we're just rolling out this engineering-based college of medicine. That's always going to be there. But there's this whole segment of society that's emerging that's going to need upskilling and reskilling. And because we are kind of locked into this notion of getting a degree, we're even thinking about a mechanism that if you were just doing upskilling and reskilling, that you could have what we're calling stackable credentials. If you wanted to stack, say, four, five, six, seven years of upskilling and reskilling, getting the badges and certificates you need, you can stack those to get a degree in engineering if that's what you want to do, but not to saying it is not starting down that path as a requirement. We're pretty much leaving it up to the student and to the learner to decide when and where and how they want to get those skills and whether they think it's a comparative advantage for them to stack them into a degree or not. But it's mainly about making sure that we are training and providing the skills that uh, individuals need to meet workforce demand. Two points on that. So the first one is that you mentioned that, you know, back way back in the conversation that you were mentioning that some students are graduating with debt and then they don't find the jobs to pay that debt. So do you think universities should have uh, more skin in the game, meaning that if they cannot pay that debt back, should, should, you, like, should universities help them pay? No, I, I don't. So that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So no, absolutely no. What we're doing is a much more thoughtful way to deal with that. As I told you, we're spending $50 million more than we were spending in 2016 on financial aid. The reason that we have 54% of our students graduate with zero debt is because we're investing more in students, increasing financial aid, reducing the amount of borrowing that students have to do, that's the way you handle this. You don't do it by essentially uh, creating a situation where the university is expected to come in and underwrite or cover the cost for debt incurred. Keep the education accessible and affordable on the front end and making sure you're providing the means to help students graduate. Um, I don't necessarily buy into this notion of a free education. I do subscribe to the notion of a debt-free education. And so every decision that we're making on the financial aid side, uh, the whole philanthropy side, that's why the main goal of our campaign was to raise money to provide more scholarships and more fellowships to students. And so that's our approach is to provide a debt-free education, not a free education. Somebody has to pay for it because in an environment where you know, states don't have don't necessarily pay what they used to pay. Uh, you know, when I'm one point where this university where more than 20% of the budget come from the state, we're sitting here now with about 10% of it coming from the state. So financing higher education is a very complex issue. Our core commitment is to provide a debt-free education, a transformative education to as many students as we possibly can. And I can tell you, sitting here where we are today, there are not very many places I will have you to know that can truthfully tell you that 54% of their students graduate with zero debt. You hear just the opposite narrative. Or even higher. Yeah, even higher. What was their second point? And the second point is that over time, universities have become more of a uh, trade school where you go there to get certain skills because, you know, like jobs, you know, CEOs, <laughs> Come to university and like listen we need we need this skills but universities in the past were, was more of a place to where you go to learn how to think not necessarily to get certain skills uh maybe universities don't have to be one or the other you could they could be both but uh from what we've seen is that universities have become more of a uh, you know you learn this specific thing because of x job should universities go down 
or like should these universities should go that that down that path of you know more specific skills or more of a well I'm I'm, I'm not going to agree with you on that because okay. I think universities for a long time um, you know ever since universities were created hundreds of years ago has been about um, making sure people have the ability to think and you know then that's why you have very strong philosophy departments et cetera et cetera but um, the job market and the industrial age, and I think in everything, the industrial age and all the other ages that follow now the technology age, has kind of driven people more into specific kind of skill set. And that's why you pursuing a degree in engineering. And you're pursuing, I don't know if you guys are mechanical or whatever, but the job force and the interest of the individual is what drives the pursuit. And so the notion of uh, universities having been this place where you come into to get some generalized training hasn't been that way for a number of years. But let me just tell you what this university does that I think does it at scale and better than most places. Because um, if you look at how we go about pursuing our research excellence, it's structured traditionally across 16 different colleges you know, where students can decide to come in and major in something and minor in something else. But at the same time, the reason we're sitting in this facility today is because a guy named Tom Siebel had the great vision of being one of the first self-directed multidisciplinary educational experiences. Tom has degrees across three different platforms, business being one of them. And he did that intentionally. And so the Siebel Center for Design is all about design thinking. And how do you get students to think more broadly about their educational experience? And we are one of the few places that our research agenda is structured that way because in addition to the 16 colleges, we have 10 interdisciplinary institutes that are what I call the connective tissues across those 10 colleges, or those 16 colleges because is that multidisciplinary approach to problem solving is the kind of educational experience that the workforce is demanding. Nobody is really interested in a, somebody to come in that only knows the technical side of electrical or mechanical engineering and don't have the perspective of the integration across the humanities and the social sciences in order to solve a problem. And so more and more what we're contemplating in this university is how do you leverage the expertise that we have in problem solving through the structure of 12, 16 colleges, 10 multidisciplinary institutes. We're the best, one of the best places in the country, if not the world, in using multidisciplinary approaches to solve and find solutions to complex problems. We don't just look narrowly at one particular discipline. So the biggest challenge we have now is trying to figure out how do you do that across the educational experience at the undergraduate level, for example? How do we make sure, and I think this is the other side of your question, how do we make sure that we're producing undergraduate students who know how to think critically? How do they benefit from a place like Siebel Center for Design and how do we make sure that their educational experience reflects that multidisciplinary approach that has been so successful on the research enterprise? How do we now, it works, we already have it at the graduate level and professional level. How do we do it at the undergraduate level? And I can tell you the university will be the first one to, to, to crack that complex structure is one that is gonna be at the cutting edge and we pl we're planning on it being us to be the one to figure that out. Some smaller institutions have done it because they are smaller scale. There's not another place of this scope and scale that's figured out how to do that and we're embarking upon a process to try to figure it out. Because it's the way, it's, it's, it's the, I predict, uh, history will tell in the next 10, 20 years, Multidisciplinary degree programs are going to be the norm, as well as upskilling and reskilling to meet the workforce demand that don't require a college degree is going to be what higher education institutions are going to be known for. That's going to be the general framework of how they try to 
carry out that mission. Not everybody is going to be able to do it, but places that are situated like Urbana-Champaign is best uh, prepared, I think, to deliver on the type of education that's going to be necessary to not only meet the workforce needs uh, of society, but to solve complex challenges as well as meet the individual needs of those that decides to pursue a degree or skill set after finishing high school. And I completely agree with you about how, like that's the direction we should be heading towards and how a multidisciplinary approach is what should be the norm. Because like today I talked to my friends like in engineering and everything, like they've never even like explored the south side of campus. Like, like you can tell, like it's only like North Quad is mainly engineering, right? So, like, and that just makes me think, like, okay, you're gonna spend four years here, but you're never gonna fully explore or, like, just see the extent of how much we have on this campus, and yeah. that just like blows my mind. Like, like I wish there were more. I wish like one thing is personal, an, an intrinsic motivation to explore yeah. and to see different these di different departments. But um, if there could be done if there could be something that could be done for people to seek these things, like that's the, that's the like, what we should be going towards and I think. I, I could agree with you more. And again, I'll use Tom Siebel as an, uh, as an example and this structure that we're sitting in now, part of the original vision was to put this up on the North Campus. Oh. But it wouldn't have done anything to address the exactly. issue you were talking about. When, Tom was first approached about investing in this Siebel Center, this Center for Design, Design Thinking. Originally, the thought was to put it up on the North Campus, but uh, my former provost, who hopefully you still remember, I think he was one of the greatest provosts in all of higher education, Andreas Kangelaris, former dean of Granger, and uh, former head of computer and uh, electrical engineering department, convinced Tom that in order to foster mm -hmm. that interdisciplinary interaction, that you needed to place this not up on the North Campus, but here closer to the South Campus. Right. Where, dude, just what we thought, there are more than 38 different department of colleges that, I mean, you just walk through it at any point in time, you find students from all over the university, not just from the engineering or the business school, that are using, utilizing the assets in the, that we built into this building. So, <clears throat> That is very much was strategic and intentional on our part. And how do you facilitate something? Design thinking is for every discipline, not just for engineers. Exactly. It's got to be for people in social sciences, the humanities, as well as the ones in liberal arts and sciences as well. And that's the reason that this place is sitting where it is today. Like solving <clears throat> problems is going to need people to go beyond um, like the standard thinking. Well, it became, it's become very clear, even in my own discipline, is when I was hired at University of Minnesota in 1978, I was hired to be part of a multidisciplinary team that would approach the issue of how do we improve the yield of important agricultural crops. The notion is that that was mainly done by the plant breeders mm. using traditional plant breeding techniques. Well, we know the impact of genomics and mapping right. the genome has had on that. And it really has become more and more multidisciplinary approaches because the physiologists, molecular biologists were supposed to study the underlying mechanism that you're trying to improve, understand where the shortcomings are. And then you use, um, you use genetic engineering uh, techniques to now modify those characteristics in plants and animals, fungus, virus, or whatever it might be. So this whole multidisciplinary approach to problem solving has been going on for a party for, uh, for decades now, but really has come into its own um, using genomics, for example, to bring about the changes and traits that you want to see in plants or animals mm -hmm. uh, to make them more productive has kind of been one of the hallmarks of my own discipline. And it clearly has, it's applicable in other disciplines as well, as a case in point. Some of the work that's been going on about gun violence uh, in urban community is now being connected to the genomics work that's going on in IGB, the Institute of Genomic Biology, because uh, the interest from a 
a social scientist who wanted to understand fundamentally if you grow up in an environment where there's constant gun violence, that has to have some environmental effect on gene expression that may lead to disparate health outcomes for one zip code versus the other. And sure enough, that's what the data clearly shows. You can be in juxtaposed community where there's a prevalence of violence and the prevalence of, uh, of certain diseases are much higher in one than they are the other. And a lot of it has to do with the stress associated with living in an environment related to gun violence. And so there's all these gene, gene environmental interactions that come to play. And you can really only understand those if you're taking a, uh, a multi-academic uh, perspective and approach to trying to find solutions, the underlying cause, and then finding the mitigation strategy that's going to have the most impact. <clears throat> What is, is something uh, absurd that you may that you may do? So, if, like for instance, my phone is in black and white because it's less distracting. Uh, you know what? I, like my phone? Yeah. Is it, is it is in black and white? You have a black and white phone. Like the display. Like the display. Yeah. Oh, can, the display. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not the not so, the actual. <laughs> if you can see, it's completely oh. black and white. Oh. Okay. So that that so that's something I do. I, I, I have a friend who every, every time he, he eats a burger. He arranges all the the like the like the cheese and everything in a way so like every bite is uh, is uniform. Is there anything else that, that you do? Like maybe quirks? You mean what kind of yeah. quirks do I have? Uh, I don't think I have any. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I nothing that uh, nothing that I can think of, and nothing that I hope people find irritating. I'm sure I have a few, but uh, I don't know what they are. Do you put cereal in your milk or milk in your cereal? I put milk in my cereal. I do the opposite. Oh, okay. People uh, <laughs> call me absurd for that. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, uh, the end result is the same. Exactly. Right? Exactly. But yeah. yeah. That's something people care about. I didn't know that. I only realized it once I came here. Well, and some <laughs> people eat and then drink water at the end. I mm. like to do it intermittently. I like it all, you know, right. eat a little, wash it down, you know, so to each his own. Like a balance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. like it. When you look back in your life, you know, you've, you've <clears> had <throat> many experiences all across the board doing different things. You know, what is the, the moment you will, you will never want to forget? Maybe it's not necessarily related to a job, but maybe it's uh, related to, you know, your, your family or a memory you, you will never want to forget. Mm. I don't know. That's kind of a hard one to answer because there have been more than one. Um, I guess if you distill it down to the important events, I think it was when I got that call that at 26 years of age, almost a year before I graduated, I'd been hired as an assistant professor to do what I've always dreamed of doing. I didn't plan on doing any of this presidents and chancellor stuff. The only thing I've ever planned was to be the best professor that I could be. And at 26 years of age, uh, to be hired by the University of Minnesota on the tenure track to lead and create a brand new laboratory in plant physiology as a part of a multidisciplinary team of people working to improve the yield and stability of important agricultural crops was truly probably the most foundational experience. And to do that at 26 um, mm -hmm. was not a, not a normal circumstance, so. What do you feel at that moment? Do you feel that, you know, working through, you know, high school to save up for, for college, all the struggles that you, you've had, you know, trying to pay for college and everything else, well, do you, I, you think it was, it was worth it? Like, like what do you feel oh, at that well, moment? absolutely. I felt, I felt great sense of pride, great sense of honor, you know, in multiple ways, not only because there are not a lot of folks in my discipline that look like me, and to be the first African-American hired to be in a scientific role of this nature at the University of Minnesota, one of the additional great land-grant universities, urban land-grant universities. And so it's a great sense of satisfaction and great sense of pride that uh, I was, that what I, the dream that I laid out for myself was coming to fruition. I've always wanted to be a university professor and always wanted to mainly focus on doing research. And so to me, that was as good as it 
could get at the point. I had no idea it was going to lead to all these other things in life, but that was the, the most profound uh, activity that happened along the way that I think provided an opportunity for me to be where I am today. I find surprising that you didn't <coughs> want to be a TikToker or, 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 or YouTuber back then. Uh, no, I don't think they had those. <laughs> yeah. They probably would have said, Tick who? And you what? <laughs> No, if I had been, then uh, you've been interviewing me from my billion-dollar jet flying around the world. <laughs> maybe, maybe. In your studio. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's a dream you had, but what's been a, what's been a dream that you had like had to let go of? Has there been such, such, such a thing for you? A dream that I had to let go of? Uh, I had dreams of once of being a uh, an artist, hmm. drawing. Oh, really? Yeah. I wasn't that good though, so why not? Go. Why not a singer? Because you come oh, from. Oh, I've a done f- that. Right. I, no, I've done that, so I lived that dream. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I didn't mention that because I lived that for thirty years. That's true. Yeah, but uh, being a, kind of a sketcher or just art in general, I love art and a little bit of skill. But I have a son who's very, very good at it. And as good as he is, hmm. he can't make a living doing it, unfortunately. That's the way, unfortunately. So he has to do it as his passion. And for me, singing became a passion. Right. It was never an opportunity, a means for me to make a living, but I had a chance to do it professionally for 30 years, concurrent with all the other things we've been talking about. So I feel it truly blessed. When unfortunately for him, you know, he has to spend his days as a drug rehabilitation counselor and then when the mood hits him, he'll create some piece of art when he can. Mm. So, and I, that's unfortunate because I think we all should have a chance to, uh, to do what we're most passionate about. But it doesn't always work out that way. And, and I think uh, the song that, what, like, one, like one of the songs, I think, it, I think it was called Sounds of Blackness, I believe. Mm-hmm. Even won a Grammy Award at some point. Actually, two grams. Two, oh, well, yeah. even better. <laughs> Would you be able to, to, to sing a song right now or maybe that one? No. You don't have that uh, ability anymore? I have the ability. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's tries to, trying to get me to sing here for this almost six and a half years I've been the chancellor. And, you know, I sing because I care about it and uh, and I love doing it. But, no, I'm not, I'm not here to entertain. I'm here to lead and to help motivate the university to hire heights of excellence. So so that's my reason that I'm sticking to it. Do so. you think once you retire, you'll sing for us? I doubt it. No? No. <laughs> I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> How can we listen to that's you then? Not, that's, you can go back and listen to... Uh, Recorded? Yeah, right. Sounds <laughs> of Blackness and uh, AKA 1993 till about uh, 2010. I mean, I joined the group in 1980. Right. But we didn't really start to record our music and get a recording contract until about 92, 93. Hmm. And so all of that music that was produced from about 92, 93 up until 2010, I was a part of all of that. But, you know, the group continues to morph and it has young people in it now that were babies when I first joined, you know, so... And some of those folks that were in their teens, you know, have kids. Some of the folks that are like me have grandkids that are singing in the group now. So it's been around that long. Wow. The group has been around. Started out as McAllister College Black Choir. It's probably been around almost, oh, my God, almost 40, probably almost 45 years now mm-hmm. since its inception. So, What advice do you have for, for young people, either somebody in high school or in college, about Wanting to live a life of impact, following their passion, and living a life that they can be truly proud of. Well, I guess the advice is what you guys have exemplified by doing this thing that you've started here. It was something you felt passionate about, something outside of your normal engineering studies. You felt that it could meet a need. And so I just encourage students to always do what they're passionate about, but always think about ways to be innovative, to do things that have not been done before. And then even if they've been done before, how can you do them better? And how can you make a difference? It's all about making a difference during the time that we have on this, this big rock 
And so that's my only advice to students is to live a life full of reward and full of giving back and making a difference in any way they can. So if you could put a billboard in Green Street, what would you put? Um, and what would it say? What would it say? Yeah. I don't have a clue. I mean, we have billboards all over the state. We just got a new one that just went up that flags all the companies that came, not all of them, a small number of companies that have come out of this university. Uh, I don't know. Just say, make a difference. Mm. Believe in yourself. Make a difference. Yeah. We have a section at the end of our, our shows that we call overrated or underrated, mm -hmm. where we ask you, we, we say a topic or a statement, and you tell us whether, what, whether you think it's overrated or underrated. Yeah. Okay. So, the, so the first one is uh, Galapagos. Underrated or overrated? I haven't been there, so I can't say. My <laughs> wife wants to go. I would say underrated. I'll stick to the criteria you <laughs> Modern art, underrated or overrated? Underrated. Really? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Because I think most people are kind of purists, and if it's not 100 years old or 50 years old, then it's not art and it's not to be as appreciated as some of the contemporary stuff that's being produced. And I find it all interesting. I saw a, um, like last year, I think there was a piece of art, which was just a banana mm -hmm. stuck to a wall, like on tape, and it sold for millions of dollars. Um, like some people still find value in art like that. So like an invisible iron, one iron, uh, was iron. sold too. A what? An invisible piece of art was sold. You can't see it? <laughs> but yeah, it was sold, yeah, in, in Italy. How do you sell it if it's invisible? You may. It's all about being a good businessman. <laughs> Storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. Last there one. Acting. Hmm? Acting. You've acted in a lot of holiday videos for our campus and continue to make more. So yeah. acting. Do you, do you enjoy it? Underrated? Overrated? I enjoy it to the extent that it helps build a greater sense of belonging and connection between the students that have chosen to attend this university and those of us that have been given the responsibility for making sure they have a get a world-class education. That's why I do it. Hmm. I don't do it necessarily for its entertainment value, but people seem to appreciate it and seem to look forward to it. And I do think it builds a great sense of belonging. And when I was growing up, I didn't care who the president or the chancellor was, and, and that those individuals didn't make any intentional effort to make sure that they were right. approachable. And being approachable and making sure that our students know who I am and my leadership team is critically important to me. So that's why I do it. I just happen to have just a bit of little acting talent that grew out of all of those years of not, not just performing with the Sounds of Blackness, which clearly... People don't understand that part of what we did was not just the vocal. We used to do a couple of theatrical productions every year, and I did that for 30 years, as well as uh, in elementary and high school. I used to have this thing called the Lysing in feature, and I would always end up getting the lead dance role or the lead speaking role in some play or something. So it's been part of my uh, my existence all the way back to elementary school. Hmm. So, Okay, guys. Perfect. Afraid I got to run. Thank you so much for you. coming, uh, spending time with us, and sharing all these wonderful stories. Well, I appreciate it. Hopefully you can find something in all that, uh, that goulash of ideas and perspectives that you can use. And, and thank you for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed learning more about how universities run, all the hardships that come along the way, and just l keeping up with the lessons that you learn from your life and applying them to what you're doing today. Um, as you mentioned, he faced a lot of hardships growing up and all of those still resonate with him today and are involved in a lot of, a lot of the decisions that are being taken today in this university. Um, as we saw with President Colleen too, running such a big university is not an easy task, especially when you have people from so many different backgrounds and interests and uh, financial needs, right? And there are so many problems, but you cannot 
it, it can get overwhelming at times, but I think this conversation gave me the reassurance that there are people who care, there are people who have went through the same things that we are today. And there are systems or efforts that are being put in place to just mitigate those hardships that we face every day. It's, it's a privilege studying at such a prestigious university, not because of its name, but just the opportunities and the kind of people that we find here. And it's, it truly is an honor, an honor just meeting all these different people and getting this context and a really multidisciplinary education, like what we mentioned during the conversation. And that's the direction where we're heading and it's a direction I'm excited about. So thank you so much for watching. Stay curious and we'll see you next time.